Hello, and welcome back to Let's Get Lit. In today's episode, we're going to be going over the movie review for The Canterbury Tales. So, buckle up, because this one's an interesting story, and um, there's a lot that happens. So, join me for a crucial warning into the world of The Canterbury Tales. Let's get into it. All right, so let me just break this down for you because it's kind of a story in and of itself as to how I got here. The first thing is that I looked up different media adaptations of the Canterbury Tales, and I found three that I was interested in. One, there was a cartoon like little sketch of some of the different stories that I remember watching in high school. Tried to look for them, couldn't find them. Not available, don't know why. The second one is a BBC adaptation, and my brain went, oh my god, yeah, like that's the one I want to I watch, because the BBC is very faithful to a lot of sources. Couldn't watch it. Wasn't in my region. I don't have a VPN, so I wasn't able to like hop my way along to watch it. So the third and final option, I go on iTunes, and there is a film version, and I'm like, oh my god, perfect, I'll watch that. And it all it says is follow Jeffrey Chaucer as he writes the Canterbury Tales. So I'm like, oh, this is perfect. It's on MGM+. Plus. So the first thing that should have been my red flag issue, number one, this movie was rated NC-17. Pop on MGM+, Plus, see the warning signs. For those of you who don't know what the rating system is, for uh, Motion Pictures of America, the MPAA, you have a G, which is family friendly, all audiences, blah, 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 PG, parental guidance suggested. So it's stuff that's like maybe not appropriate for five or six year olds, maybe some potty humor, who knows. PG-13 means that the movie is generally safe for most audiences, probably more for 13 years of, or older. Then you have your R, which is restricted. That is, uh, you have to be accompanied by an adult or a parent unless you are 17 years of age. Then you have NC-17, which means no one under 17 can watch the film, doesn't matter if you have a parent or not. Then you have X, double X, triple X, you get it. If you don't know what the X rating system is, good for you, you're still pure. If not, you know what that means. So this film was rated NC-17. My first thought was, oh, okay, well it's Middle Ages, I'm sure it's, this film was from Italy, so I'm like, okay, there's probably going to be some nudity in it, that's fine with me, I don't care as long as it serves the story. And if you've read the Canterbury Tales, or if you watch the series, you'll know that there are some videos and some stories that do contain sex stories or things of that nature, so I was fully prepared for that. That's where my mind went to. So this version is one of the weirdest versions I have ever seen of any kind of adaptation. And I say that because one, the biggest flaw for me is the story adaptation for this. With the Canterbury Tales, it's very easily set up. You have your introduction, you get to know the characters, and then each character tells a story. That's how the book is set up. That is how I thought the movie would be set up, because it's literally a framing device. A framing device is a type of archetype in writing where your story is contained, follows a certain path. So I thought the film was going to do the same thing. This film does not. This film starts off just kind of a rough Middle Ages setting, and you see some of the characters that are going to be telling stories, or who you think would be telling stories, but they don't explain who they are. I mean, they just kind of are there. It's very confusing. All right, uh, the second thing that's really weird about this is that they don't tell you when the story is going to change. So when I first was watching this, you have the general introduction, and then it just goes straight into the story. And I'm like, what are we doing right now? I have no idea. But it was very hard because throughout the film, they never told you where one story ended, another one began, or if there's an interlude section with Chaucer writing this story. Let's talk about the second thing with this movie. There is a lot of nudity, and I mean a lot of it. This film, doing more, uh, doing more research on it, I found that this is an Italian film from the 80s, and it just throws in nudity even when it's not needed. Uh, several of the stories that require nudity, like The Miller's Tale with the affair, or I think it's The Merchant's Tale, where, again, they have an affair. That's fine. The thing that bothers me is that a lot of the stories that they do cover that don't involve sex or nudity, they just shove it in there. I mean, it's just full on for everyone to see, men and women. So at least there's equality in the nudity, but I mean, you see everything from everyone. Now again, if it serves the story, I don't mind, but it can be very off-putting for people who are not a fan of nudity. 
I'm going to now break down how the flow of this movie is, so that way you can kind of understand where I'm coming from, and the different variations. This movie takes eight of the stories and puts it together, makes a film. The first one is going to be The Merchant's Tale. Uh, this is the one about January and May, where May commits infidelity with another man, et cetera, et cetera. I would say, reviewing this story, it's about 60% accurate. There's the characters, uh, there's the general story plotline that follows. There's just some weird choices that were made. Um, the acting in this film is not ex non-existent. There is no acting. It seems like they just took a bunch of, how do I say this on YouTube without getting demonetized, adult film actors trying to be Hollywood actors is what it feels like. And a lot of the choices are very just off. Um, the emotions are everywhere. They're either really up there or they're really muted. Or they get really upset and they start waving their hands and feet and yelling or they're very quiet. And I'm like, there is no middle ground. Now, that could be a thing of Italian filmmaking. I don't know, but it just seemed really off for this story. After The Merchant's Tale comes The Friar's Tale. This is the one where he goes to, this is the one where the summoner goes around and extorts people for money and he tries to, that's how he makes his living, sees the demon, uh, promises to be the demon's brother in arms, then gets dragged to hell. All right, so this one is weird because the entire first half of this story that is filmed is about the summoner who's going around and he's finding men who are homosexual or who are gay extorts them. One of them is like a king or a prince and he's able to pay it off and not be able to be killed. Another guy who's a peasant can't be, bribe him off. Then he gets burned at the stake. You literally see them throw him on the stake and then obviously it's a body double or a prop, but then they light it on fire and smoke and you hear the screams. Don't know where that came from. That was an addition. Who knows? But after that, then the summoner goes on the road, meets the demon, the rest of the story plays out. So weird addition. Don't know why they did that. The next one that I don't think I can forgive is The Cook's Tale. In 10s, 12s style, it's very weird because The Cook, if you watched the series, is a very short story. It's like a page, not even a page. Uh, basically, The Cook is like, ah, oh, there was a guy who was drunk and he played games and the friend's wife was a whore. They decide to turn this one into a Charlie Chaplin-esque character and they filmed it very not in the style of the Middle Ages. The guy was wearing pants, which is weird, like actual like pants pants and dress shoes. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? And then it's like a the slapstick, the main character of the Cook story in the movie. It's very Charlie Chaplin-esque. He does these weird like waddle movements and he's got very like ah expressive notes. It, and then somehow he ends up in a threesome with someone and then they just like I, for adaptation wise, it's not really an adaptation. Like, I guess they kind of took the thing. I don't, I don't know. After this one, we go into the Miller's Tale and by the grace of God, this one's actually about 75% accurate. You have all the characters, the storyline follows through. I don't have too many quabbles with this one because I guess because it revolves around sex, the filmmaker was like, yeah, and just decided to adapt it. I don't know. After that one, we get into the Wife of Bath's prologue. This one irritates me because in the book, she talks about all of her different husbands and how, yes, she, even when her third husband was dying, she was going to marry the fourth husband and kind of the quality stuff like that. I thought that was great. In the book, she's a really good character. In the movie, in the movie, they basically just make her into a Black Widow-esque character and they only make her interested in sex, like the physical act of sex. So, and it's shown in the movie where she spies on Jenkins while he's taking a bath with full nudity, you see all of him. And then there's a part where they um, talk because she tells him that she's gonna marry him and how he seduced her or whatever. Um, how do I say this appropriately? Um, you watch her give him a hand. I guess that's the best way I can say it. it, it pretty much where the, I mean, the end of the story is where she gets hit by him and she's like, I'm gonna, you know, blah, 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 blah. And it, it, that part is right. It's like maybe 20% accurate to the book. 
Next, we're going to go on to the Reeves tail. And again, along with the Miller's tail, this one's actually pretty accurate. But then you get to the last one, which is the Summoner's tail. Oh my god. Guys, there are things in the Summoner's tail that I can never unsee. Never unsee. That's all I'm going to say. Um, let's talk about the story of the Summoner's Tale. If you don't know, it is the one about a friar who is going to visit an old man who is sick on his deathbed. The old man's like, I have a present for you. He's like, it's under my butt, so just reach in for it. I keep it safe. Friar reaches in, the guy farts on him. Friar gets mad. End of story, blah, 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 blah. That part is accurate. That's not too bad. The part that gets me is after that, in the story, in the book. Um, an angel comes down, takes the friar into hell, and sees where all the corrupt summoners and everything go. The movie covers this, and it's wild. I mean, it's like wild, wild. So this little like child angel comes down. He's like, I'm going to show you where all the corrupt people go, blah, 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 blah. In the book, the angel takes him down to Satan or to Lucifer, lifts up his tail. There's all the friars. There you go. Um, but in this version, you go to hell accompanied by grotesque amounts of nudity. Again, this, I kind of can see where the filmmakers are going because biblically, religious-wise, you would be vulnerable, vulnerable, nudity, that's fine. I can handle that. In this version, the friar looks over at Satan. Don't even see Satan's face. It is, a, it is an Italian man's booty cheeks. And you can tell it is real booty cheeks. It is not a prop booty cheeks. And let's just say they cut from this image to friars jumping out. I'll let you catch the innuendo in everything else. Um, I feel like I know this Italian man personally at this point because the camera lingers on a certain part of his body for way too long. And let's just say, I feel like I am very intimate with a man from the 80s who is Italian, whose bottom half of his body is painted red. That's all I'm going to say. And some of you may be asking, well, why did you continue to watch it? Because I thought it was going to end. I thought at some point it was going to just completely like, okay, cool, we have this shot for like 30 seconds, let's do something else. No. No. You literally see it for like four minutes. I could not look away. I tried to. I couldn't, because every time I thought, surely we're not going to, and we're seeing it again. And then I'd be like, okay, maybe we're not going to, and we see it again. And then I'm like, okay, well, maybe we, nope, comes right back to it. In closer detail, like a zoomed in shot. No. So, anyways, um, I'm never going to unsee that. I am scarred. So I'm going to tell you, no, don't do it. Don't do it. Uh, anyways, that tale ends. Then we get to Chaucer, and at the end of the movie, Chaucer's like, all right, here's the Canterbury Tales, and basically I told this only for the pleasure of telling them. Haha, <laughs> amen. Done. No. In the book, he ends it with the Parson's Tale. He asks his readers to forgive him for any vulgarities or things like that. He just wrote them down from what the other people were saying, and he's asking for penance and forgiveness. Not in this movie. This movie is all about the hedonistic qualities. That's what this movie is. Is there any good? And 10%, I would say that, again, the Miller's Tale, the Reeves Tale, some of them are accurate, not very much. That's kind of where it ends. Let's talk about the bad, the script. The script is really bad. And I'm kind of like, how could you mess this up so royally that even I, who just read the story, could not follow? Like, it took me about three minutes into each story to realize, oh my god, we've changed. Shouldn't have been that hard. Literally spells it out for you in the book. The direction. The director did not do a good job. I think he purely just wanted to put as much nudity into this and to make a to make an exploitation film, if that makes sense. Like he kind of took the name of the Canterbury Tales and he's like, <laughs> there's some fun sexual romps in this. Just make it into a movie. No. Uh, the acting or the direction of the acting was terrible. Like I said, they were more like adult film entertainers and not very good ones who are trying to act and not actual actors taking this series. I just, I think that the biggest thing for me, again, with the script and the director, is that with a story, Chaucer sets out and he has these stories of conventional truths to them. Whether it's blue grade humor, whether it is high lofty prose, there are lessons or stories or sometimes morals 
with all of these different tales. That's the beauty of the Canterbury Tales. You can have something that even in the Miller's Tale where it's still kind of dirty and it's perverted, there's still like a theme of like, please don't have infidelity, please don't cheat. Like, you're gonna get your comeuppance in the end. Um, that's thrown out the window in this movie. Anything that's raunchy or dirty or like, hey, this is naughty, they all view it as okay. And it's like, there's no lessons. There's no morality to it. So they strip to me the good meaning of the story away just for fun exploitation purposes. And it's just really dumbed down. I mean, this version is very dumbed down. It's telegraphing it out to the cheap seats. Um, and it's not done well. Like, I get if you want to simplify something to make it easier for everyone to understand. I get that. But literally being so dumbed down that you lose everything else, no. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not for it. I will say, also with the nudity in this film, that's unneeded for the most part, you could tell who was going to be naked in this movie based purely on physical looks. About halfway through, I started playing a game of like, I bet they're going to be nude in the next scene. I bet I'm going to see them naked. And not because I wanted to, not because I'm trying to, I was trying to be perverse, but because every time there was a semi-conventionally attractive person on the screen, they end up having their clothes off. I'm not even joking. Like, it's very sexist, male and female-wise, with the nudity that you see. So you could have someone whose character is very important that might have had to have had nudity for the, for the film. We're not going to see them nude because why would you want to watch them nude? It's the person who doesn't make any sense but looks conventionally attractive. They're the ones who are going to be shown nude. So stupid. So let me spare you all the time and trouble with this adaptation. Number one, if you're in high school, you do not need to watch this. Your parents need to set a TV control. You do not need to watch this. This is not for you. This is not meant for you. No, no, no. Number two, if you're in college and you're reading this, do not watch this and think that you're going to be able to understand everything. It ain't going to happen. Not at all. None whatsoever. No. Number three, I don't understand why it was made this way. Maybe I'm just not getting something, but anyways. Do I recommend this? You should know this by this point. No, I do not. I cannot recommend this for anyone. If you are the, I feel like personally, if you're the age of like 19 or older, hell, 20 or over, and you can handle this stuff, and you just want to watch a wild experience, go ahead. But it's not good. I wish I could have seen the cartoon <laughs> to, cleanse my, to cleanse my eyeballs out, or the BBC version. I have a friend who has a VPN. I'm, I'm gonna go check the other one from BBC out and see if that's good. Um, I need to sanitize my eyeballs now. Don't watch this or else you'll need to sanitize your eyeballs. Join us in the next series as we go over the next classic literature. I hope you guys have a wonderful day. I will see you guys later. So please remember to like, share, and subscribe. If you have heard of this version or have seen this version, comment below, YouTube appropriate, YouTube appropriate, what your thoughts were, but do not go out and look for this. Don't do it. Have a great day. And as always, stay lit. Music